I'm going to do things a little bit different today, but let me start by saying uh, hello, everyone. My name is Aaron Goins, and welcome to All In on Real Estate. I started this meetup because when I was in the military, no one in my circles talked about real estate. A lot of times they talked about thrift savings plans, uh, stocks and bonds, and debt. And a lot of times we deploy, see a lot more Dodge Charger and pickup trucks on the road uh, instead of appreciating value items like real estate. So I started a meetup to educate people to um, so that they can build generational wealth for them and their families. Um, so I want to do something a little bit different today. I like, like my main, my main man, Lawrence Laddie. So I want to go around the room um, to everybody and please introduce yourself. So starting with Shamil, can you introduce yourself to everybody? Yeah, absolutely. My name is Shmuel Siegel. I'm from Los Angeles, California. I'm a commercial real estate broker. We deal mostly with retail. I do investment sales along with leasing. We've done a lot of multifamily deals as well, office space, industrial, a little bit of industrial. Honestly, I don't like industrial. Um, always happy to help, always happy to share advice, uh, help out however I can. And uh, I guess that's me. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for having. Thank you for here. All right. Um, Kevin, can you introduce everybody? I'm Kevin Leons. I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. I am an accountant by profession, looking to get into the commercial real estate side. I've done smaller multifamily deals in the Georgia market and looking to stay in that market with the commercial multifamily. That's it. Cool, cool, cool. Um, Fred, what's up, man? How you doing? Listen to yourself, everybody, man. Good to see you on here. Hey, Aaron, how's it going? Uh, yeah, finally made it. <laughs> finally made it. Um, let's see. Uh, my name is uh, Fred. I'm uh, originally from New York, moved out to Connecticut, and I'm uh, pretty much a bird investor out here. So I buy things off market and uh, do the renovation, rent it out, lease, um, refinance, and, and keep doing that. Uh, just moved out and started doing some work on the Pittsburgh market. So actually trying to do uh, take that bird model and actually try to change the neighborhood without changing it. So I've been I've, I've teamed up with a couple of uh, buddies from grad school and we're trying to actually buy those properties off market, renovate them, um, lease them out and then feed the feed uh, people from the, the local apartment. So we have a relationship with a large apartment owner. So we're trying to get those tenants who are from that particular community and get them turn them into actually homeowners uh so we, we have a relationship with them as soon as we finish the property hopefully we can give that that um whoever in those whoever those tenants are get some training make sure their credit's all good to go and get them actually into home ownership so we're trying to change the neighborhood trying to change the look of the neighborhood without changing the look of the neighborhood um and that's uh that's pretty much where i'm now now um i was in marine Corps for 11 years and actually right now working aerospace is my w2 so Fred is a, a valuable, valuable asset for for us and our military real estate investing hour uh, on uh, Clubhouse. Uh, I know Claudia can vouch for that. Um, it's a wealth of knowledge. And I just thank you so much, man, for being on here, man. No, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So speaking of the Ryan, ride or die, Claudia, can you introduce us yourself from Germany? Yes, hi. I'm in Germany and have some station here. Um, we'll be here for the next two, two and a half years. Um, I'm a veteran. I served for seven years in the U.S. Army, and so we've, you know, we're in the military now. Um, we're in Germany, so my focus while we're here is long distance real estate investing, and um, where I'm looking to. Um, my market is uh, Illinois, which is my our home of record. So when my husband retires, our plan is to go back to Illinois. Um, we have one property, a single family home on the south side of Chicago, and um, right now we're looking to invest in the Aurora market. And so it's, it's a process, a lot of learning, a lot of ups and downs, a lot of, uh, it, it's been crazy, it's been very uh, educational and um, like fulfilling, um, doing a, a lot of, uh, edu you know, learning and meetups like like meet like this. And so um, I'm glad to be here and thank you for having me. I'm glad I'm not speaking. <laughs> <laughs> that's great right there that's great Allison are you here all right oh uh, yeah I am sorry it's uh 6 p.m here and I'm in the middle of eating dinner uh 
So I'm originally from uh, the Philippines, but I live in uh, Seattle, Washington. Currently right now I'm in Alabama doing uh, rehab on a multifamily. Um, in the future, I, the reason why I'm in this group is because I want to get into co commercial multifamily. So I'm basically learning all I can to facilitate that group. Okay. All right. Thanks, Ellison. Desmond, what's going on, man? Introduce yourself. Hey, good evening, everybody. Desmond here in New Jersey, single family investor, townhouses in the Virginia Beach area, looking to grow into the multifamily and also grow my network and build with Aaron and Laddie and Daryl and all of you. That's, that's an abbreviated introduction for you, for you, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm also here cooking at the four. I'm at Wolfgang Puck here. I'm also a chef now. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay, okay. I'm making dinner. I'm making dinner. That's all. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, a future guest in a couple weeks, Mr. Edmund Chen. How you doing, man? Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm a, uh, an experienced capital raiser. For those of you who don't know me, uh, experienced capital raiser for uh, almost 20 years in financial services. So I work for a private equity firm, uh, mostly focusing in on real estate syndications for high net worth or all accredited investors. Also a licensed stockbroker at the time as well. So I'm an investment advisor um, and uh, essentially graduated over, once you start dealing with that, uh, graduated up to a family office. And now I'm retired from the industry. And all I do now is uh, essentially manage our own wealth and I coach and I advise people on how to raise capital and how to build a practice. Thank you, sir. And last but not least, I don't know, I, I don't know who this guy is. I don't, I don't see there's something missing in his name, but I don't know. Uh, I think his name is Lawrence Laddie. How you doing, man? Please introduce yourself to everybody. How's everybody doing today? Uh, my name is Lawrence. Mr. International Laddie, you AKA, um, I live here in New York City, uh, the bar of the Bronx, recently retired, um, working on my first multifamily deal, looking for my first multifamily deal and working on hopefully working on my first multifamily deal. Um, I have six units here in New York City in the bar of the Bronx, uh, just looking to gain knowledge and also here to support my man, Aaron Goins. <laughs> okay, well, my name is Aaron Goins, um, and like I said, I just uh, introduced myself as far as why I did this meetup. Um, I fought on my own, but today's guest could not make it. Um, he has a military obligation, so I'll be the guest speaker, master ceremonies of this of this meetup. Um, and there's a couple of things I do want to talk about, um, and then I will open the floor to everybody. I want to have a, just a general conversation. Um, as we have done in the after party and things like that. So just notice this is still getting recorded um, probably for the next 40 minutes. And then uh, we'll see how many people we have and maybe jump out the breakout rooms. I know some people come in later on too with this. So um, so just a little bit about myself. Um, I, I served in the Air Force for 16 years. Uh, my... Uh, one of the greatest things I've done in my life, um, you know, was serving um, and I wouldn't take that back. You know, been all over the world, seen a lot of different things. Uh, felt like I really grew up just being the experiences, the different cultures that, that I've been to. Um, and when that was over with, uh, I got a W-2 job, which, you know, a lot, most of us do. Uh, and what happened was one of my coworkers came to me and say, Aaron, you know, you'll be here for another 20 years. And I said, thought to myself, no, I won't. And that's when my entrepreneur spirit came. And I started to look for entrepreneurship. So I, I got into different uh, niches in, in entrepreneurship, like multi-level marketing, a little bit of drop shipping, um, but I felt most comfortable doing real estate. So um, I jumped all the way in, joined a couple wholesaling groups, uh, paid a lot of money for that. Um, and unfortunately, 
I didn't really wholesale anything at all. Uh, I got into um, Airbnb, but last year when um, when COVID hit, that kind of wiped out a lot of the Airbnb spots that we're looking at here in, in the Seattle area. Um, I took a residential assisted living course, uh, and I've always, you know, talk about that. If you know me, I, I like it. I like the part. I like what is going on with it. I think that is something big. That's the next big thing in real estate is residential assisted living. Um, and uh, but you know, one thing that I, I do like is uh, just, just having zooms and. Uh, I, I, it was something about commercial multifamily really got me. I think that um, after I got my duplex, I'm house hacking right now here. Uh, I, I was thinking to myself that, man, how many fourplexes do I need to really be good and have a residual income? Everything goes good. And I just thought about it. I said, man, I don't know. You know, that's, that's a lot of financing. That's a lot of time spent uh, trying to find fourplexes. How about this go big? And that's when uh, I turned over to commercial multifamily. So, um, and now here I am, I'm a, I'm a, um, I'm an educator, capital raiser. It's like Edmund is and, um, trying to get into my first deal. Uh, so, um, that's just a little, um, uh, short story about me. Um, I do have a, um, like I said, I was, I was hacking here, um, in my, as my residence, um, have a, I have a tenant, um, good tenant. Um, but, uh, my house is a little bit older. Uh, and, you know, one thing I learned was that the pipes in my place, uh, shouldn't be here. It should be made for a mobile home park. So I had some plumbing issues and, and I learned the hallway about that. So, um, just learning how to be a homeowner. This is my first time I holding a home. I always rent it. Uh, unless I was in base housing in the military, I rent it. So this is the first time I will own something um, my life. So, and the reason why I even got this place, even got my place is because I was, when I first got into real estate, um, a younger gentleman in his twenties was like, hey man, why are you not using your VA loan? You're a veteran, why are you not using your VA loan? And I thought to myself like, well, you know, I just haven't really looked, thought about it. He said, dude, why don't you use the VA loan and buy something? And I thought about it, thought about it, thought about it. I said, you know, he's right. He kept on pestering me the whole night. And that's when I went on the journey. I think 10 months later, I finally got my place. Uh, it was a long journey to find to find something that I even liked. Um, and also an earlier guest, Megan Greathouse, uh, who was one of my guest speakers um, two months ago, she helped me do the numbers uh, for this place. Um, because I didn't know how to underwrite. She knew how to underwrite. She she does small multifamily and she helped me out with it. So I'm really appreciative of her. And then also uh, the organization I was in, uh, they part they part me and somebody else um, that we met each other met each other doing a group. We partnered up and we brought a property um, out of state. And now we're getting a rehab and we're gonna try to put college students into into the places right next to the university. It's less than a that's in a block away from the college university. So we're gonna try to put college students in there starting in August, but we'll see how it is. And I'll let everybody know the progress of that. But um, other than that, that's that's the, my whole real estate career. I'm, I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, I'm still out here in Tacoma, Washington. I've been here for 11 years. Uh, but um, matter of fact, I, I just, one of my friends just, uh, just, um, hit me up and uh, asked me to promote one of his, uh, he has a, uh, he's doing something for kids in Baltimore. And I'll talk about that in, in a little bit about his organization. Um, because I think that's really, 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 really cool what's going on. So, um, but let me, before, before I get into another subject, anybody have any questions or anything like that you want to ask? Okay, so, all right, so, all right, Lawrence, you you can ask a question. You don't have to raise your hand. Well, just that. Let's say, listen, thanks, Harry. Kim's, um, not here. Kim's not here, so you don't gotta worry about that. <laughs> Thank you for uh, sharing your story, man. Um, so now, 
what did you, what made you decide on staying in, in Washington? And what, what made you what made you decide to stay in Washington? Then? So, so basically I had got back from deployment and basically I was on leave. I, I, I had like, I had stocked up because I, I was deployed and, and I had, you know, when you already got the military to give you extra time. So I had about four months before I, I retired, the early retirement out. And I applied all over the nation. I mean, I applied, I applied in California, Texas, Georgia, uh, Maryland, Connecticut, I applied for ESPN one time. Um, but I was, I was trying to get a job that I really felt comfortable with. So I applied over the nation and I know I at least had over a hundred applications I, I applied for only had only at the time only had a communications, a CC degree, CCF or communication air force degree. Um, so, um, but I only had two interviews. I had a, I had an Amazon interview and, an, and another, um, interview in, with the company I'm at now. And here I am. So that's the reason why I stayed, uh, yeah, cause of the job. I was going to move back to Maryland and work with New York, New York life and be a life insurance agent. But, uh, when I got the phone call saying that I got accepted to the job, I just said, I'm gonna stay out here, but if not, I would probably be in Maryland being the New York life, um, life insurance agent. So, um, and, uh, that takes me to another thing too. Um, there is, I think, you know, people in the military can tell you, I think Fred can tell you things like that. It, it can be a hard transition for people getting out. You know, um, it's it's totally different. In the military, you feel like you, you're taken care of. You have a certain structure. It's a structured environment. When you get out of the military, it's the wild, wild west. You know, you're on your own. And a lot of times people have a hard time. And that's the reason why in the, with the hell of Ellison, we started a um, house home as vets. Um, call we had earlier today. Um, you look at my YouTube page, you'll see it. Um, I put, I posted it about 30 minutes ago, but a lot of people have a hard time getting out because it is a structured environment. And like, even for me, when I got out, I had to have a mentor at my, at my job because she had to get me out the military lingo. Call, so I call her yes, ma'am, no ma'am, you know, call her by her name. Uh, and things like that, but there's there's a lot of people who are struggling when they get out, and some people don't want help, and and some people who come homeless, and now even in this in this era with COVID, there's a lot more homelessness in, in our nation, and uh, you know I start start we started a call to try to help to try to help with that. So if you guys want to go to my YouTube page, you'll see the homeless vet calls that I have on here, and you'll see Ellison talking about his journey and what he's doing in Montgomery, Alabama at the moment. And what he's learning from his experiences, we're trying to help homeless vets in that area. Cool. Any more questions? There. Um, you, you mentioned that, um, that, that someone told you you'd be there at that job forever. He said, no, <laughs> no, thank you. Um, now, what did you think an entrepreneur was at that point? Because yeah, I, I spent a lot of time on the uh, even on the civilian side, and still, like, I'm still shocked at what we didn't know. <laughs> I'm so shocked at all the information that I'm finding out now that I didn't know. Uh, entrepreneurship, I, I I thought I understood it also. Um, so it's really just like I'm trying to see what your perspective was. What did you think it, it meant to be an entrepreneur then? I didn't have the scope of knowledge then as I do now. I I just thought, man, like. I got, I got, I can't be working all the time. Man. I, I've been working for, I've been working 16 years in, in, in the air force. I don't want to work for somebody else. So I was just trying to find a reason to, 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 um, to do something so I can work for myself. That was, that was the first thing I thought about. So, uh, my brother, uh, um, had like a t-shirt company. So I thought that, man, you know, I can buy some t-shirts from him. I can sell it out here because you're, um, cause he has like a t-shirt company that, uh, basically is, it's called year of the bird and it's for like bird teams. So I'm thinking like, okay, I'm in the Seattle area. We got a rapid fan base for Seattle Seahawks. It's going to be easy. It's going to be easy. So 
what happened was I brought, I paid a thousand dollars. I had like four or five like big boxes of um, t-shirts and sweatshirts. And okay, I said, look, okay. All right, I'm gonna I'm a go. We are, we have a local hockey team and we have the Seahawks. The Seahawks. So I'm gonna go and um, I'm gonna sell t-shirts at these, at these sporting events. So I brought me a table. I was like a little vendor outside, just outside a little arena for um, uh, for the hockey team. And I'm like, hey guys, you're the bird. Uh, you know, we support the Thunderbirds and the Seahawks because it's, it's called the Seattle Thunderbirds um, for the hockey team. So I'm out there, people come by me, Kima come by me, oh, let me see this. Oh, okay, you're the bird. Okay, cool, 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 cool. No one gets it. Next week I come by, no one gets it. I go to I go to the Seahawks game. Now remember, uh, Century Link Field, or they, they renamed it, has sixty eight thousand people. I went to the place where it was me and another guy. He was selling fake Seahawks beanie caps. So, you know, if if you saw it, if you open up, like, that's that's fake. But it has like the Seahawks 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 logo. So I'm next. To, so he's a. So we are at the same spot. People, a thousand people coming by. I'm selling my t-shirts, sweatshirts. He's selling the fake beanies. He made, and I got there about, I don't know, about an hour and a half or something like that before the game. I I, I, I drag all my stuff. I drag all my clothes. I put, I put the table up. I'm ready to roll. He has fake beanies. He made $826 selling fake beanies. People was just going in droves. Fred, I made zero dollars. I made zero dollars. And I was just like, like, you know, I was just like, just, just bugged out. Cause I was like, man, you know, hey man, this is, this supposed to be easy. This is entrepreneurship supposed to be easy. And um, so just say that I just took a lot of L's um, being an entrepreneur, even in real estate, just like I said, I haven't, I, I really didn't wholesale anything. And I've been, I was, Ellison can tell you, because me and Ellison wholesale together. Uh, matter of fact, in the reason where he's at right now, we try to wholesale and there were homes that we were getting super cheap. I remember this one girl was offering me two homes for $10,000, but it was abandoned homes for the most part, but we couldn't find nobody to sell it to. So we had to get up a deal. So I took a lot of L's on entrepreneurship, but that's not stopping stopping my spark from from stopping. So, um, but yeah, I, I just thought, man, when I first did it, that this is going to be something easy. You know, you just be your own. But I, I didn't understand structure. I just jumped jumped everything. Shiny light guy jumped to everything. Uh, I got into coffee too. I think that okay, I'm in Seattle is the coffee nation. You know, everybody buys coffee around here. Starbucks is this is the home of Starbucks. So how about, you know, I, I get some coffee here, sell coffee on the side. Nobody want coffee here. Everybody wants Starbucks. So, so you know, you, you think one thing, but you think it's going to be easy because what people do, but actually people want want the authentic stuff. And that's something I had to learn the hard way. Uh, it's funny because uh, you say learn the hard way, but that seems to be the only way. <laughs> Right. So everyone who's gone through entrepreneurship, there's no you know, overnight success. It seems like everyone who's when they go through it is 10 years later there. It's an overnight success. So um, I don't know. It's, it sounds like you uh, you went through the normal path, <laughs> but it's definitely easy to learn from others. But yeah, yeah, those, yeah. those are the life lessons. Yeah. I'll I tell you like this, too. I'm, I'm not trying to bash nobody. When I first got into uh, wholesaling, I brought a course. And I'm thinking like, man, you know, I had a coach, coaching program, all this stuff. Um, I had somebody who watched over me. Uh, I talked to you all the time. But what he did in his region uh, worked for him, but it didn't work here. So I did what he told me to do. Um, he told me to call real estate agents around here. What he did was he called real estate agents in his area he had like 50 real estate agents to go to, you call them, you'll call about five a day and they'll show, they'll give him deals. They'll say, hey, I got a deal for you. He'll wholesale a deal, blase, blase, blase. 
I did the same thing here in Seattle. They don't, they don't work like that. And I was told by, from, from Asian, we don't do that stuff around here. We don't just give deals like that. But hey, I'm trying to be obedient students. I did it anyway. I used to call people my lunch break. Hey, call, you know, I called 10, 12 people. Hey, are you, are you a real estate um, friendly real estate agent? You know, real estate uh, investor friendly real estate agent? Yes. Okay. Hey, man, you know, and I, I maybe got two deals. And even those didn't go through. So I've had a lot of lumps um, as, as an entrepreneur, but I'm very, very excited about, about being a capital raiser and, um, you know, just learning from my mistakes. Awesome. Yeah, I think I'm actually, uh, I, I planned on being a wholesaler and <laughs> ended up uh, just being my own buyer. So I did the, you know, the three day course. I was like, oh, it's interesting, but it all sounded very new. Um, so I, I, it didn't, it sounded so new, it didn't sound real. So they're like, oh, okay, just go send out postcards and then wait for the people to call. And um, I, I gave it a go, but yeah, definitely the, uh, close, you know, I was able to get that piece of it closed, but actually get, didn't quite get all of the steps. Um, ended up doing it myself, but it's still, I, I expected to be a wholesaler and just ended up being more of a burr investor, which I was happy with long, long term, but um, it, it, it definitely was different hearing it than executing. So, right, right. But yeah, no, it's definitely not easy. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I you know, for me, I, uh, I, I just jumped into stuff and, and, you know, I think a lot of it, and I talk about this now is emotional decision-making. Oh, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, instead of, you know, really sitting down thinking about it, I just jump right in and, you know, just learning file by trial by fire that, you know, you can't make it emotional decisions with entrepreneurship. You have to really, uh, you know, take your time, really think about things. And um, that was not me when I first got into it. Uh, we, we, I tried to do drop shipping. I was going to be two, it was me and two other employees and uh, one of the employees or one of my coworkers, I mean, she, she didn't drop shipping before and she was supposed to be like, you know, teaching us how to do drop shipping and it didn't work out like that. She dropped out of it. I was a person who, who built everything and I miss I got out of it. So, um, you know, so I, I understand about partnership as well. Cause you know, um, you, you so excited about something, but you know, taking your time and, and really understanding the legalities, everything about it before you start jumping in. And that's something that now I'm done now is, is take my time. And uh, like I said, I, I, but I really do like what I'm doing now. Um, I think it fits me for who I am. Hey, Aaron, can you tell me some of the advantages of the house hacking that you find? Uh, my, the house hacking I got now? Yeah, house hacking in general, you see some of the advantages. Because when people ask me, I, I ask them, you know, what is their their lifestyle? Are you single? Are you married? Because before I got married, I thought about it. I said, I really wanted to do house hacking. But once I got married, you got to consider someone else. So uh, what was the advantages for you with the house hacking? Some of the advantages you see? You see? Well, I, I think it's kind of the most decision, decision making because it was like, man, I want to own something. I want to own something. But... I think looking back at, I mean, looking looking at it, it's something that, um, for me is is it's it's I wanted to start something. I want to start something small, so that's why I got a duplex. And and, and to be truthful, finding a, a fourplex around here is hard. It's just okay hard, and everything is super expensive. Uh, but I, I think for me, the advantages is that um, I get to work. On, I can do everything on my own here. I don't need a property manager. For the most part, you know, unless it's something that I'm not really good at, like plumbing or something like that, um, I think that look, I mean, you you're owning something, you're taking care of it, it's your property, um, you know, tax advantages as well uh, with this, um, and you know, for me, I I just it's it's all it's still all new. It's this is still all new. I'm on uh, next month will be my first my first my first full year here, so. Okay. And I, I plan on doing it again with my VA loan. Uh, okay. I plan on getting another property in another state using my VA loan. Um, I don't know I'm gonna get, I don't know if I'll get a, uh, a, a multifamily. I, I would want to, um, but right now being a single guy too is, is an advantage too. I don't have a lot of space here, but being a single guy is not a problem. Yeah. Um, 
you know, if, if you have a family of four, this probably won't be for you, you know, unless you get a bigger, a bigger duplex. But somebody who's single, who, who's hungry, who will start off, I think this is the perfect place. Um, get a duplex, a, you know, and, and save money, learn, trial by fire, and then, you know, learn from your mistakes. I think um, a couple of weeks ago, Maurice Philogene was talking about that. Like, you know, you know, when people were partying, he was, he was cleaning toilets and things like that, but he was learning trial by fire as well, how to be, how to take care of the condominiums. And now it's easy for him because he has systems in place. So I think putting systems in place as well, while you're in the process helps out a lot. Come on, Greg. Come on, Greg. You here now? Come on, man. You just got here. Come on. Come on, man. I'm I'm the guest speaker of my own of my own meetup today, man. My guest speaker uh, uh couldn't make it. Um, in, okay. So, um, you have any questions, anything like that? You got to ask one question, man. Well, um, um, right now I have a, I don't have a question, you know, especially given I'm late, but um, I do have a couple of things if if you don't mind. Um, so for the for the house hacking, um, yeah, there there's a there's I don't I don't know if if um anyone is aware that you can either um, use use a you can also use a use a FHA loan, which is a, a usually a three three point five percent down, um, in order to to buy a property up to four units, and live in one and rent and and rent the other three. And that is a, a form of house hacking as well, not not just um, you know splitting splitting rooms. Um, you can also do it with a VA loan for the for those for those of us who have the VA loan act, um, option. Um, and sometimes the FHA have what's called a $100 money down payment. So instead of three and a half percent down, sometimes actually a hundred dollars down payment. So, um, of course you, you pay closing costs, anything else as well. And for qualifying for the, for the, v, for the FHA, it's typically, um, two years in the same industry, working in the same, same industry and, uh, showing that you are, you are not even showing you are able to pay. Cause I'm, I'm as a, as an agent, I had a client who kind of like, like the day before it was, it was due to actually put down the money. That's when he finally got, got the money in his bank account and he paid, and he paid for it. He still qualified for it. So it's an option out there. If you are looking to house hack, you don't have to share the house. You can have your own, your own place and rent the other three, the other two or three units out. And that also um, will work as well. So I'm you know, just, just a, a thought on that. And I'm also, I'm, I am working with um, with um, uh, with yeah um, the, this this crew and um, the group is growing and there's a man they have we have about twenty no so there's, there's a that's actually it's about forty um, forty properties throughout the U.S. Um, multi-family properties for sale. Um, when I say forty, that there, there's there are there are several that's actually part of a portfolio package. There's one one portfolio package that has like seven um, um, and it's a seven portfolio comes out to about 1600 um, units um, total. So um, in, in five states, for example. So if, if anyone's looking for, for, um, for, um, for a deal, um, yeah, we have Georgia, Texas, North and South Carolina, Virginia, Ohio, and just another state currently, I forget what other state it was. So if you're in those areas, we've got some 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 in ATL, some in Raleigh. Um, just some, let me know. Hit me up. Okay. All right. All right, man. But when you finally get your question, because you're the question guy, uh, you know, just just feel free to ask. <laughs> um, Claudia, you got any questions, anything like that? Oh, she might she might be on the thing. Okay. Anybody else have anybody else have any questions? Anything like that? Okay. So uh let me let me let me let me uh move it over. Is anybody have any deals or any 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 problems, anything like that, um with deals? or it's something they're going through right now or, or anything they want to just talk about like as far as deals.
Um, all right, so um, I got got two deals that I'm that I'm actually I'm looking at with with um with a couple couple of folks, um, both in both in Texas. The first one, um, we we're we're looking at it, and and so we we we're, we're trying you know just just some underwriting it. So we called a we called a the agent, spoke to him last week, and he informed us that the the company that's actually selling that that one one hundred twenty four unit also has a one hundred seventy unit that they're trying to sell, and they're um they're breaking out a partnership, and so they have to divest um off the, from from those from those units. So we actually we under we sat down we underwrote the second one, the second one with a hundred actually 171 unit is actually much better than the, than the first one. And the biggest problem with the first one, for example, um, and just, just, just as, as a, as, as a FYI, I guess for anyone who's, um, is that um, they, they have a loan that's assumable, which would be fine, but their assumable loan is at 5.9%. And I'm like, and, and so, and, and uh, the, the fee, if you want to get out of it is 1.3 mil. So, because um, for 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 early payment, um, so I'm just just um, one of the one things that to, to look out to look out for because um, um the loan being assumable would be fine if it was at a reasonable, relatively reasonable interest rate. Uh, when I say relatively reasonable, based on current market interest, you can get a bit, much better interest right now on it, and and so. Um, and so, one of the things that I'm, I I spoke to, to the one of the potential guys are looking at is okay. How about if we calculate the difference between what we could get for interest on it now and what the what the five point nine interest costs us, and deduct that from the total price. That way, we've we, that, that way we'll we've recouped that 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 difference. So we can get a we can get get agency on that on that property at four percent. So there's a 1.9 difference. And so um, how much does that 1.9 cost us over the, the time that we're, we're gonna, be, gonna be taking it? And then we, so we can say, okay, then let's deduct it over the, off the price because the owners can't get rid of it right now. Cause no one, no one, want, no one wants a 5.9% interest on assuming, uh, assuming a, a mortgage um, for 424 um, units. Or had to pay a uh, um, uh, 1.3 mil, which which is a ridiculous amount of price, given that the the property is about six and a half mil, and so they had to pay 1.3 mil um, for um, for early out. Doesn't make sense. So that, that, that's that's one of the things that I'm that just how we're we're trying to just um, um try to find ways around some of the some of the contractual issues that people do with their when they make a contract and just thinking out outside the box. Any anyone with any ideas or any? Hey, have you had any such situations? Anyone? No, quiet. Uh, I, I haven't, but I'm just wondering. Um, so you, you're saying that uh, the early payment is 1.3 million. Uh, what's it? Was that a five year? Like how, how long is that? Is that the full life of the life of the loan? Um, no, it's a, the the early payment fee, right? The fee, so 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 basically, um, um, um it's it's one point three mil, um, and so so we, um, so we, we, whatever we're, all, we're offering, we have to pay one point three point three mil over that to to get out of the, to get out of the the current loan right now, which doesn't make sense. But if you say it in that loan, because I know and on the residential side, I've I've gotten loans where they say you have you know have that five four three two one, so you if you pay it back within the five year period, there's a certain a prepayment penalty, um, um, and it's usually not. It, it, it could be bad, but it, when you factor into the number, sometimes it works. Um, so it's like, and when I asked how much is the actual prepayment, they're like, "Oh, seven thousand. I was like, "Well, I, the interest wise, I'd get out of a deal for seven thousand." <laughs> um, but so if you the five point nine percent, I like what you said. So would you would you be able to calculate the interest expense? For a certain period of time, and then remove it from the purchase price. Uh, you know, um, yeah. just to, that's, what, yeah. that's what you said, right? Yeah. So, the, do, um, so the, um, do, do, do you guys think? Do you think something like that will work? Where we we um, we we can calculate the, the difference between what we can actually get 
currently and what we're, we're forced to, to deal with, and then see if we can actually um, therefore deduct it from the total price. I don't see it, it, it's, I guess the, the value is whatever someone will pay. So if they, if they're willing to do that, you could refinance later, right? So you, yeah. you can, you yeah. get that discount. You can refinance earlier if, if you have the equity in there. So I'd, I'd say that would be your approach saying, you know, the, the person, what is it, would expect to hold it for five years. Therefore the interest expense for the next five years based mm -hmm. off of that is this. So they're asking for a discount. And then they're like, oh, we don't like that. And okay, so you could reduce the yeah. discount, but they could refinance. You know, you figure out when they could refinance. And if they could refinance in two years versus five, then you make the difference, right? Like well, they benefit from the difference. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. It sounds like a good idea. I, I haven't executed at something like that, but it sounds like it, it, it makes sense as a, this is why we're asking for a discounted price. And then you go in with that and then you have the flexibility to do whatever afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, wait, wait. Yeah, I'll, I'll go on and try to do a calculation. Uh, I, might, I, might need, I might need a few more information from the, um, from, from the broker just, um, just to see yeah, and we, um, at what points in time um, if certain fees, fees um, can be lobbied because I'm there, um, yeah, if, if you're getting out after, after the year or two, you might be, the fee might be, say, it might be 1.3 mil, but then what if it's after three, year three, is it, is it one mil? Is it is it eight hundred fifty thousand? Don't know. So, how? Yeah, we'll ask that information from the from the, age, from the broker. And all, it's a fully rented and all that. That's uh. Um. Yeah. It's it's not fully rented, but it's actually um. Yeah. At ninety five percent, um, occupied. So it's pretty good. Is yeah. it below market rents? Um. So, <laughs> The, the the rent itself, um, actually, but both complex. The rent itself is it's kind of, it's kind of weird because, um, they have, they have um, um a, a multiple mix of 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 units that have, which also have a multiple mix of sizes, and so you have a a, a one by one that is like um, was it six hundred and nine square foot, and then you have you have no you, you they have a bunch I would say like nineteen one by ones that six hundred nine square foot, and then you have on another. No, um, um, 10 one by ones that is now at, at 650 square foot. And mm -hmm. so, and so some of the, and, and the, some of the rents are, are above market, but a lot of them are below market. So we had a flexibility and look like the, the rent tolerance level seemed like the market, the market there is willing to accept a slightly above market rent because there's enough people who are, who are paying slightly above market rent right now. And, and so it might give us a flexibility to actually push the other ones close to market or at market and keep the above market where it's at and still be able to actually make, um, um, add, make, yeah, make some, some value add to it. Yeah, I look at that for like, a, you know, at least a two years before probably refinancing. If, if there's a window for increasing the rents and then in two years you could refinance and then pay the guy off, if they can accept a second um, a second holder, you know, since they desperate, uh, giving them the one point some million, maybe they'll take half. And then uh, when you, in two years, you give them the other half, but maybe with a, you know, maybe three, four, five percent on top of it. If it, you know, if they're willing to do it. Now, might, um, what do you mean by, by second holder? If they they don't own the property outright, so the bank or whoever has it is the first lien holder, right? Okay, yes. So they have equity, and they believe it's worth one point whatever for them to take out, and you assume the mortgage, right? Mm -hmm. So yes. Minus the one point something, whatever that amount is that the bank is owed, you purchasing it at that price, uh, getting a loan at that price for whatever the bank wants, and then the the seller uh, would be is almost like you borrowing the one point something from the seller, and they could be the second holder. They would be the second lien holder. Second lien holder, yeah. Right. So, so they 
get the property off their hands, you give them a few dollars, maybe half of what they're asking for. If the uh, if the appraisal comes in at a real high amount, maybe whether they give you a line of credit, the bank to pay half of what that guy mm -hmm. wants or the seller wants. And then if the property has enough value to add over the two years, when you refinance, you pay them the other half because you'll be able to bump it up and then their value will be high enough. But sometimes people who own properties outright, they can do the seller's finance. But when they mm -hmm. have when they have something on it, uh, a mortgage on it, then sometimes the bank's a little bit more uneasy with it. Okay. So that's so that they was willing to carry. Are they willing to carry some money for two years? Okay, so so it's so basically um benefiting from their equity current they currently have on it, um for for two years until we can actually offset that that difference and then buy them out and get them right. out of there and okay, right good yeah because awesome. sometimes yeah. They, they they're not going to be well that's going to be hard for people to just assume they'd rather just get a loan from the bank and then the the seller has the second holding and they probably say okay you give them. 500,000 of the 1. Point million. So that means you got carry, they're going to carry 500,000 that you owe them and they might take 7% a year on that. Who knows? Okay. All right, cool. Thanks, guys. Good education right there. Good education. Yeah, definitely. Hey, Edmund, you got anything? Anything to add or anything you want to share? I want to say something here. I'm sorry. I'm having issues with my internet. And sorry, like I got I had to drop off. I couldn't. I couldn't answer. I couldn't talk before. But um, I just so so I just had a question about like your journey along like this, you know, real estate journey and and what you're doing and um finding your team. So like um uh, the your coach. Like how did you find members of your team like along the way? Like I would be. I'm just curious to find out. You know how that came along. Um, so what happened was I didn't want, I didn't want to make the same mistake, um, that I did with wholesaling, but I wanted to make sure I did have a, still have a coach. I didn't, that my belief in having a coach was still important and I didn't want to go down a new entity like capital raising while having a coach. So what I did was, um, I was on Zoom at eight and uh, I saw a guy speak and immediately I had a conversation with him. Uh, I got, I got, I got his info and got, and had a conversation with him. Um, and, you know, we talked. So then, you know, thinking like, am I gonna make a emotional decision? Uh, okay, okay, Fred, it's good to talk to you, man. Thank you for being on and, uh, um, we'll have a guest speaker next week. Uh, but um, anyway, um, so I, I, I started asking for, asking around by the person. And, you know, I, I, I got a lot of great, um, everybody was saying great, great things about him. Every time I talked to somebody, I asked, oh man, he's great, he's great, he's great, he's great, he's great. Um, and sorry about that, I got a teenager right here who's, on her phone, but um, um, but anyway, I, you know, and and then basically me and me and my coach, you know, we had another sit down talk, and I liked everything he said, and I say it will be my coach, so um, he's helped me out, um, and one of his students just spoke, named Greg. Um, and you know, we have like a little community. It's not, it's not a big culture community. That's what I like to, um, you know, we have one-on-one -on -one time with them. So, um, and that's, that's basically it. Um, you know, for capital raising, you don't have to have a, a, a team if you don't want to, I think Ebony can t tell you to, um, tell you to, uh, tell you that, but. Uh, I think for me that I eventually will probably have a, a VA or something like that too, because I need structure. Um, that's one thing I learned about myself is that, you know, I think coming from the W2, coming from the military, is that I always had structure. Um, I have a continuity book. I have different things to, 
to have me a structure, a foundation, so that I know what I need to do to get where I, the goals I need to do to accomplish. So um, that's something I'm working on too, is make my own continuity book so that somebody takes my place, a role where they can have and look at something, look at the continuity book so that they can understand and go from there. And then if you have questions, they can still you know contact me. So I'm in the process of making a continuity book if I, I get a couple of deals under my belt. What about like a lawyer or like a CPA? Do you not need that like now? Is it something you'll get later or? I, I got a CPA. I, I got a CPA because of my my duplex and my other property. Um, I made a mistake last year doing taxes. Uh, so yeah, I, I definitely, I got me a CPA recently to help me out. Um, I also got QuickBooks to, to I gotta use it more to help me out. Um, uh, I, I, I did have a lawyer to help me with my LLC and putting my, my, uh, property here under LLC. Um, I, I did give with Anderson, Anderson advisors too, to make an um, umbrella LLC, uh, in, in another state. Um, so I do have, you know, a couple of things, a couple of people I can always reach out to. Matter of fact, um, if you guys see my third meetup, you'll see my advisor on Anderson Advisors speak about tax and things like that. And I had to reach out to him. I haven't talked to him in a long time, but that's for me. But, you know, right now I, I know as for me, I need structure and that's what I'm trying to work on. All right. Hey, um, yeah, so I, 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 I had the same thing also, just, just um, that, and we can, we can have that, Inter support of one another, um, and I know I'm I'm looking for I'm looking at Anderson also to see if I can actually be able to work with them to to make sure my stuff are properly properly done. Um, and how satisfied are you thus far with with how they the, the service they provide? I don't have a problem with them. I mean, I, I think you know they. They, they have their structures, um, they have their systems. I think it's, you just really gotta interrogate for yourself. Some people have have not given good reviews about it. I don't have a problem with them, um, but you know you just gotta ask yourself, what do you want from them? What, what service do you want them to be in control or help you out with? For me, it was the Umbrella LLC. That was the main reason why I got with them uh, because of that. And I wanted to go to another state and have somebody monitor the LLC um, while I was in, you know, one, you know, here, and they can be basically my uh, custodian. Yeah, for the registered agent. Right, right. Let's say, um, and uh, CRM. I know a few weeks ago we talked about CRM. Were you able to um, to find a CRM? Yes, uh, yes, I did. Uh, I got pipe drive uh, for my CRM, um, and that's something that. I'm still working on. I, I think that one thing that I've done, and I think um, I think Edmund is probably the best person to talk about this one. Uh, I'm start, you know, as you guys know, I'm a, I'm a big networker. I uh, love to network with people. Starting to get more and more people. Starting to have more and more um, conversations with people um, outside of outside of, of the meetups. Um, but now I'm getting to the point where, you know, I haven't connected with people in a while. I need to start sending emails out just to you know talk about this talk about this meetup mm -hmm. talk about that just to get people engaged so that's the next step too and i had to i'm still at a phase like okay what can i really put on there but i got to start sending emails out soon get people because i'm starting to i'm starting to have people ask me about deals and there's a couple of deals that are that are in my radar that i got approach about so i got to do due diligence on that um, and probably get an underwriter to look at it uh, for me, um, if I look at it, if I review it and then have an underwrite look at it as basically second pair of eyes, uh, just to, and then, you know, also like my coach told me, do I, can I really, do I really know the, the operators, you know, what's my relationship with them? Can I really basically be in a marriage with them for five, three to five years? So I really got to, you know, really have more sit down sit down with operator. I had one operator I sat down with this week. Uh, me and her had a great talk, but definitely before I tell her I can raise capital, I definitely want to talk to her again, uh, have somebody look at the deal 
and then, you know, make a decision because, you know, my reputation is aligned with my investors. And I don't want to mess that relationship up for any for anything. So I'm, I'm, wait, what what is any what are you guys doing? Anyone else doing for a CRM as way of of staying from mind to your potential investors, um, so that um, you, you don't you don't necessarily have to call them every every day, but you have some sort of automated service system that sends them a text, you know, maybe so a happy birthday text, some some good information, those kind of things um, to to stay in front of mind, is there anything that you guys are doing to that, that, that works? Anybody have a CRM system? Anyway. Edmund, do you have a CR, do you have a CRM for yours? Uh, well, there's a couple of best practices that uh, we use. Some of the firms that I, uh, that I worked for, they used uh, Salesforce. I'm not a big fan of Salesforce. Uh, it can be a little cumbersome. Uh, for me, in my coaching practice, it's a little bit different. For me, I just pretty much use LinkedIn because LinkedIn helps me recall what people look like and it, it, it keeps all my messages so I can remember you know, how I connected with them. And it just, and it gives somebody's background, right? So I see everybody's background right there. And I know, uh, and when I bring all those elements together, it's far better than a business card, right? So somebody used to have a Rolodex and you have like a collection, like I used to have a huge collection of business cards but it doesn't really go into the details. I can't remember the person look like, all this type of stuff. When it comes to investors, it really depends on your investment category. Like if they don't hang out on LinkedIn, if you've got like accredited investors that are all baby boomers and they don't have anything on social media, then you have to use something else, right? Then you have to, that's when you've really got to take a look at, do I want to use something like um, uh, some of the free CRMs out there? Do I want to use an Excel spreadsheet, some, anything, right? Uh, whatever I think works well for you, Greg, to your point, when you talk about staying front of mind, I think it's it, it's not just the interactions. It's got to be when you interact with people, do you provide value? So do you provide value for the content that you're creating or the email that you're putting out? Is that content that they get, is it worth valuable time? Is it is it worth for them to read it? And you only get a couple of shots at it. And if you don't provide that value, then the future emails that come, they'll just go into a junk box or they'll roll their eyes and it actually has a negative effect. But if you, uh, if you can understand your client really well and you can every time you interact with them or every time you talk to them, you provide so much value that your emails instantly or whatever your interaction is, it goes instantly goes to the top. So it's, it's kind of like when you had the first salespeople that were out there and when when the telephone was in, it was invented, they had salespeople that would come out and say, oh, the, the telephone doesn't work. I didn't close any sales. I used the telephone and it, nothing happened, right? You know, the telephones are useless for sales. It's not about the telephone. It's not about the medium. It's about what you say over the telephone. That's more important. It's the same thing when modern day, where there's, we can be bombarded with so many different things through text, through whatever. It's not about the medium. It's not about the interaction. It, it's more about what you say and what you're doing. It's about your salesmanship. I agree. So, um, thank you, Edmund. Uh, and that's something I have been really working on is sending that emails out very, very soon. And I think all you guys probably see email from me soon uh, with that. So that's something I got to work on ASAP. Uh, is anybody more, any more questions anything like that? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, just going back to your, well, the discussion about the attorneys. You use Anderson, and I've heard other others talk about Anderson, good and bad. I receive emails from them as well. Mm -hmm. But I'm just trying to find out, like, how come they are the ones that is the topic of discussion most of the time. Are there any others that people can use or any others that people do use, I should say? Um, I just think that Anderson has a, a great marketing ploy with them. Uh, Clint, Clint Coombs, uh, one of the managing partners, uh, you see him everywhere. You see him in, in, in different meetups. He's 
you know, he's out there a lot talking about, you know, Anderson. So uh, I think that's, that's the reason why uh, I think it's all about marketing and, you know, some of the, some of the bigger players in the game uh, in real estate use Anderson as well. So not only are you getting it from their great marketing employee, but some of the bigger names in real estate use them. So they're going to promote them as well. And Clint does a really good job of, um, you know, diagram of things about the things you should know. Uh, and so to his credit. And, um, if I, and, and also um, um, from, from my experience so far, um, if you go to the Anderson website, they provide, there, there are things you can actually um, do some, some, some classes basically for free in there. So you start, you actually, um, they build a rapport with you be, before you even decide to go with them. So you can go in and, and join one of, one of the classes about, um, about asset protection or something like that. And, and then you, you, you start to say, okay, you know what? I feel com comfortable with these guys because I've been in webinars with them. Uh, on the other hand, um, I was saying earlier in, I'm saying, oh, I think February, March timeframe, um, some, somebody, I asked them somebody about a, someone else they mentioned uh, who, does the same, who does the same thing. And so I gave her, I gave her a call. She didn't, you know, she didn't pick up. So finally, somebody, somebody contacted me back and said, um, she, she's busy, but um, in order to actually, um, for her to call me, right? I had to, um, in order for, for her to call me, I had to, to decide that I'm going to be, be a client for her and it's going to be four grand. And then there's a, there's a fee. I'm like, wait, you're not even going waste, to waste time talking to me and you expect me to pay you four grand? When I can go to Anderson, I can watch their, their, their videos and feel more comfortable with them. It doesn't cost them that much and it provides you a plethora of services. And this person here, they might be great, but I just don't know it. Um, and that's the reason why I, I was like, oh, nope. Especially as, 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 an, as a new, new business starter, I don't have just four grand just to, to risk on somebody who might, who might not be good. That's how I, person, that's how I view it though. So, but there are some out there. Is there anybody else? I mean, anybody can talk about other of the organizations? Go ahead, Claudia. Yeah. So I think uh, when I was looking at CPAs, it's funny because like the more I re read about it and research I did, the more I realized that they all have their own little like niche like ex of expertise, and so you know like you know my focus is real estate. So when I was looking at it, it's it's you have to like really like interview and and, and know that they're they're, they're um, an expert in what you do right real estate like they can help you with your tax prepare the taxes plan for it and that they know their stuff and so it's funny because like um i was listening to a podcast and uh one tax advisor was saying you know like don't look at it as an expense like when you when you put somebody in your team like they're gonna work with you and the cpa is part of your team it's like, don't think of them as, a, as an expense. Like, I got to spend money on them. Think of them as an asset. Like, how can this person help you move, like, grow and move forward? Think of them as an asset and don't think it was an expense. Because when I looked into it, I actually it, it did an interview with Anderson. Like, that was, like, my first interview every day, like, maybe in the fall with Anderson Advisors. And, um, you know, like, they have, like, the team, marketing team, like, playing coons and they know their stuff and they have all these educational uh, modules on their website. So that, that's good. But when I started, when I connected with them, I, I guess I got um, sent, I got referred to one of like their assistants or like, I guess the, their team members. And, um, you know, it just, it, I, I guess because I was really new back in the middle and, and I, I just didn't feel like confident enough. And I was like, oh, I don't know. And I wasn't impressed. And, and, and their prices scared me. I was like, they charge like they have different packages. Like they'll charge like a package for like you know like starting at two thousand, but then um, that's just basic. And then you can go to they have like a four thousand, they have a ten thousand dollar package. And I was like, oh my god, like this, I don't, what do I pick? Like I don't know what I, I you know which one to pick. So it kind of scared me off, and um, you know I didn't like I didn't like sign on then. So I, and since then I was looking and looking and looking, and so most recently like I've been putting it off, and I was like, no, I need to get somebody on board because things are moving along. And so finally, uh, somebody recommend, you know, it's word of mouth pretty much. Like somebody recommended somebody, then they're like, oh yeah, he does like like real estate, you know, he, he and so, and I, uh, you know, I was like, oh my God, like, you know, I gotta be more mindful of, uh, you know, think of them as an asset and not like an expense. And so that 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 change of like mindset was a little hard, but, you know, and, and I'm trusting the process. So I'm like, you know what? 
go with the package that makes sense for me. And if it costs money, like this is an asset and move forward. So I'm trusting the process. I, I'm moving forward. And um, that's, that has been my experience. So I wanted to share that. Anybody else have any anything or any experiences like that? I know Ellison was in that. Go ahead, go ahead, Ellen. Go ahead, go ahead, Emmett. Sorry. I think that's a, a very valid point that, that Claudia mentioned. And Aaron, you, you mentioned this too a little bit earlier on, on a little uh, on something else, which is building out a team. So one of the things that I look at when I build out a team is I'm an investment guy, right? So I take a look at if I'm forking out some kind of cash, what's my return on investment? So what, what ROI do I have? And there's two sides of the house. So you can have the asset collection side, so you can have the sales side, which you can really, you can really take a look at your ROI, right? So if you don't start, if you don't close sales and you don't bring in business, you know, you're not going to survive. Uh, you have to have some kind of value or else I'm not going to, like, if I pay you a dollar, I need to get at least $3 back in value for the firm without, like, like without you, it, it's like, because it, if I have to fork out some money, I'm not running a charity. If I'm forking out a dollar and I get 40 cents back, then I'm sorry, you got to go, right? You got to bring me back $3. The same thing happens on the, the management side. So if I have a lawyer, if I have an accountant, all those types of things, I, even if it's prevented or, or preemptive or preventative, I still need to see an ROI. So I have a legal team that, or like I, I would retain a lawyer, but they keep me out of trouble. So without that lawyer, they could, they could sink your entire ship. So, okay, there's some cost to that. So that's the cost of doing business. I got to fork out some money for that. I got to fork out some money for an account because I don't want to do my own books because for me to do it, I want to focus in on sales. So if I have to take myself off the line on sales and focus in on bookkeeping and do my own, and do my own books, I'm the most expensive uh, bookkeeper out there. Cause, you know, because Ed is, you can find a, 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 you can find a bookkeeper at much cheaper than for me to go out and raise capital, right? Because it's taking me off the line. So it's those types of things as you start to grow your business and grow your practice is what kind of things can I delegate that I can pay somebody less to do? So one of my mentors, for an example, he said that to, once you start to be a, a, a top capital raiser and you're bringing in the big bucks, don't ever cut your grass. Like, don't be the guy. Don't like make sure I never see you cutting your grass unless it's a hobby for you and you enjoy it. But if you, if it's a choice and you don't like it, you're the most, ex your hourly rate, like look, make sure you know what your value is and what your hourly rate is. And if you're out there cutting the grass, you're the most expensive grass cutter out there because you can hire somebody at 20 bucks an hour to do it. And you're a lot more than 20 bucks an hour. So if you doing it, you're, you're now do you're, you're now technically paying somebody 150, $300 an hour to go cut the grass. Right. Find somebody cheaper to do it. So that's how you start to decide, OK, how do I want to expand my team? How do I want to grow my team? Makes sense to me. It makes definitely sense to me. So um, uh, for team makeup, what are the essentials that you should have in your team? What what essential functions? In terms of you know attorney, PM, etc., you should have a new team. Are you asking me, or are you asking the group? You're on mute there, Greg. Sorry, yeah, I was asking the group. Yeah, to include yourself. So, um, well, what are the essentials that you that you gotta have? Because I'm I, I, I know CPA. Well, it's a, it's a um, real estate CPA, real estate, real estate attorney, um, good property manager, um, um, capital ra raising. Um, but what else? I think um, it, it's kind of like the chicken and the egg. And for me, keep in mind, I'm, I'm biased because I'm a sales guy, right? So for me, I look at the number one reason why most businesses fail is because they don't make enough sales. And you can have a really poorly run business, but as long as you have sales, you're fine, right? You, it's not necessarily the other way around. You can have the most efficient, well-run business, but if you don't have a shingle out there or you don't attract business, you're sunk, you're, you're dead. Now, to, to caveat that though, we're in financial services here. So in financial services, there is another additional element. We're not just selling widgets, right? So it's kind of like medicine. You, you do have to 
you do have to be careful about what you're presenting out there. So you do have to have solid underwriting, solid accounting, as well as legal compliance. So compliance is very important as well. So if you're going to go out and raise capital, you got to make sure that you're within the boundaries. So the SEC is not, not knocking at your door, right? Because one of the worst things that you can get is subpoenaed. Once you start getting subpoenaed, then you're forced to get a lawyer. And then you're already going to be shelling out a whole whack of money anyway. So you might as well be preemptive and, and at least start to build legal connections, if not starting to retain people once you get to that ability, but at least get the connections. Um, a lot of times now, like I have a lot of, a lot of legal contacts, both in Canada and even on Wall Street, to the point where I can usually get about an hour's worth of, uh, worth of consultation with a lot of lawyers, with a lot of different lawyers, right? Um, so you at least start to, start to work with some people and start to understand what, what are your boundaries. So what can I say? What can I say when I'm, when I'm going out and prospecting? And I think it depends because I feel like um, for, you know, for what I'm doing, like, like just real estate. So they tell us like to follow the process. So uh, first I, I had um start with, I had uh, the, the loan officer, I got him on board because I needed to get approved for a pre-approval letter, you know, for, for property so that I could submit it. Then um, I started like building my team in my, my, my market. So I got a real estate agent and that was like, oh, um, the interviews, like trying to figure out local agents in my area, you know, who were, I, I, the criteria was they had to be like investor friendly agents. They have to like, ideally have property, be, fam be familiar with like, you know, their market, have like, be, be like kind of good producers, like things like that, that you look for from their real estate agents. Um, and then after that, I, I had to look for my, because in Illinois, you need an attorney, like real estate attorney. So then I started to ask about like local attorneys, like anybody would recommend somebody. And then I started looking uh, for local contractors. So I, I had to have what I needed just to set it up, right? So that when I found a property, I, I had my team. And that took some time because even for like the contractor, there's things, there's like a list uh, from a bigger pockets. If you go on bigger pockets, there's like a list of what you ask, right? Um, are they, you know, do they work with uh, investors? Um, do they, you know, do, do, do they do rental grade upgrades? Because I don't want fancy upgrades. I want um, like rental grade finishes uh, that are uh, meet, meet the city's requirements or safe, safe housing, um, you know, like it's, it's passes inspection. And so a contractor who's familiar with what they do. And so, you know, I had to do all this like research and setting up my team before, um, you know, I, I was able to like, Look at a property seriously and say, hey, "I'm interested in this property. We're gonna go ahead and put an offer on the property, and then I, I'll deploy my my forces." And so, because I was just like, you know, focus on that first. I, I the CPA was the last thing on my mind, and I was just like, you know, when I get a property, or you know, when it gets really serious, like I'll I'll get a CPA. And so, I think my the last team member was the CPA actually on my team, and so that's how I did it. Now I don't know if that's the way to do it, but but um and and, and then for capital raising, I mean I'm, I'm assuming you would need like a lawyer on board, like other things that are more important. Um, because I feel like my lawyer was like not, you know out of everybody on my team, my real estate agent and my um contractor were the big ones. Um, that I I, I was really focused on. Um, and then everybody else like, yeah, you know, they give you like, even your team will recommend like people in the team, the property manager too. Actually, there was another one that I had to like interview and find out locally who, who was in my area and I interviewed a few. And actually it was funny because like, you know, you, you find out things about like the, your, your team members or people, people who you're like recruiting. So one property manager, um, when I spoke to him, I did not like his, like, it wasn't a good fit. I didn't like his mindset. He was like, oh, you're in Germany. Like, that's really far away and blah, blah, blah. And then I'm thinking, and in my head, I was like, yeah, well, you know, like, you know, I'm just setting up my team. He's like, yeah, you know, people think it's so easy, but it's, it's, you know, on the phone, like talking to this guy. And I, and I told my husband after I talked to this guy, I was like, I, I don't like his mindset. Like, he's so like, like, uh, like, you know, negative, like, oh, you can't do it, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, and the fact is that um, I know better, right? I know better because I'm part of like group, like uh, the European group, right? There's a group here in Europe who, who um, like veterans and military who invest in the States from like abroad. So it's done. They have property managers, they have teams. So it's doable. And me knowing that, I was like, okay, so uh, this guy is like a good fit. And I and I was like, he maybe like has good reviews. Good re Actually, he was recommended by like, uh, one one uh, real estate agent, right? So they work with him, and I was like, no, that's not a good fit for me. So I had to walk away from that 
person, you know, and I was like, no, I, you know, I don't want to work with them. So it's just, it's slowly, it just all came together. And that was my process. That's, that's, that's how I came to build my team. Yeah, for me, well, because I do this remotely, I have to find expertise in each different aspect. So from my perspective, I found people for every single thing that I needed to be done. Um, I am an accountant, but I still had a CPA who does my taxes and all of that because for me, I the, the, the laws are different. So understanding the laws are uh, important. So I don't want to mess that up. So I just put it to someone who has the expertise in it. But yeah, from contractors to agents to um, property managers, everyone. So from the capital raising aspect of it too, you could find individuals who specialize in that because that's something new for you as well. And everything sorts of, sort of comes together when you need it. And the relationships that you're building right now through these meetups, uh, how you can uh, help develop it and grow it and, and, and find someone who meshes with your goals and your values so that you know that you can rely on them and put some trust in them rather than you know just picking the, the first person because it's an emergency kind of case. Cool, awesome. Yeah, so um, anyway, thank you guys. Yeah, I'm just um, trying to try make a list of to identify and for capital raising, I just thought about it also. So um, typically we, I, I'm thinking of real estate attorney, but you might need an SEC attorney, which is a different specialty within that um, to keep you out of trouble. Yeah, you should talk to an SEC attorney. That's, that's something that's always good. Um, you know, the regulations and things like that. Um, so look, uh, I, 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 um, we're going to just, I'm going to, I'm, a, I'm going to stop recording and, uh, we'll just get to the after party. Basically. I mean, we only have that many people, so we want to drop, you can drop, but we want to, um, just, uh, stop the recording. So. Woo